This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 10, Five Men, One Woman. Last episode, we left our heroes, the Pandavas, living in obscurity in a Brahmin's hut, disguised as Brahmins themselves, studying the Vedas and begging their food. Meanwhile, back in Hastinapur, their blind uncle, King Dhritarashtra, and his wicked son Duryodhana were resting easy in the belief that the Pandavas had died in the house fire in Varanavata. Only the king's younger brother, Vidur, had any knowledge of their escape, and he kept that knowledge to himself. It seems like the boys were in hiding for quite some time, but it is unclear exactly how long this period lasted. All we know is that they settled down to a routine of begging food each day and sharing their gains equally. They would each deliver whatever they had been given to their mother, who habitually told them to share it among themselves. Half would be given to Bhima, and the remainder divided up among the rest of the Pandavas equally. One morning, while the boys were all out, Kunti overheard a conversation in another room by her host family. They're arguing about who should carry out a very unpleasant task. The father insisted that he should be the one to go, but his wife objected, saying that he would leave her a widow with orphans, and so she should go instead. His teenage daughter then spoke up, saying she was the most dispensable member of the family, since it was inevitable that she would leave the family anyway. Finally, their young son volunteered to go, offering to use a stick to kill the malefactor and save his family. At the boy's words, Kunti had a suspicion that her hosts needed protection. Kunti and her sons were all really of the Kshatriya caste, and were only in the disguise of Brahmins. For Kshatriya, protecting the weak is their first duty, so Kunti interrupted the family's debate. She said, whatever the problem, let one of her sons volunteer for the service. Their Brahmin host loudly objected. He explained that the village was being oppressed by a Rakshasa named Baka, who demanded food and the life of one villager as a tribute each month. Each family in the village was taking turns in carrying out this tribute, and this time the job had fallen on them. He said that a host should never put his guests in any kind of danger, especially if they were Brahmins, as he thought the Pandavas were. Kunti pointed out that she had five sons, while her host only had one, so she could spare a son more than he could. She informed Bhima of what she had in mind, and Bhima readily agreed. When Yudhishthira got back, he was a little bent out of shape that his mother had made a decision about the family without first consulting him. But he was quickly persuaded that since their dharma's kshatriyas was to protect the weak, Bhima should indeed take on this task. The next day, Bhima went out in place of his host and brought with him a wagon load of food which was the tribute for the rakshasa. He guided the cart up to the rakshasa's dwelling and began eating the food. As Bhima devoured the food, the rakshasa came out and saw this. He grew furious, but Bhima kept eating. So Baka struck him on the back with both fists. Bhima seemed not to notice and kept on eating. Then the ogre uprooted a tree and swung it at Bhima. By this point, Bhima had eaten all the food, and he turned and grappled the tree with one hand, tearing it from the ogre's grip. You can imagine the rest, another fighting match that would make a great high school production or even a big-budget Hollywood film. The outcome was predictable. Once again, Bhima grabbed this ogre by the head and by the loincloth, and bent him double until he was broken in two. Bhima then carried Baka's dead corpse to the gates of Ekachakra and left it there, then slipped off back to his family. All the other Rakshasas in the area came by and saw how easily the mighty Baka had been killed, and they swore off cannibalism and fled from the area. Yudhishthira was concerned that Bhima's feet might attract attention to themselves, so he begged their host to keep it a secret. The townspeople quickly ascertained that it had been the Brahmin's turn to feed the ogre, and they asked him what had happened. The Brahmin lied and told them that a stranger, also a Brahmin, who had powerful magic, had offered to go to the ogre in his place. He said it must have been the stranger who defeated Baka. Thus the Pandavas were able to maintain their anonymity. Just a few days later, another Brahmin came wandering by. This one had news of the king of Panchala. Remember how Dripada, the king of Panchala, had been defeated in battle by the Pandavas, and had half his kingdom stripped away by the Guru Drona? Well, Drupada hadn't been idle in seeking his revenge. This wandering Brahmin told the Pandavas that Drupada had gone out seeking a powerful sage who could perform a sacrifice that would give him a son capable of defeating Drona at war. Drupada wandered the ashrams along the rivers, seeking a virtuous sage who might help him. He finally came upon a sage named Upayaja, who he was sure would be able to grant him this desire. He offered Upayaja great wealth if he would assist in a sacrifice to get him a powerful son. Upayaja was not interested in wealth, however, and did not want to help. Upayaja then mentioned that he had an older brother named Yaja, who was also a capable wizard. 
Upiaja said he had noticed his brother was none too particular, that he had seen his brother pick up fruit off the ground and eat it, without first investigating whether the fruit was impure or soiled. Upayaja also recalled that his older brother never hesitated to eat the leftovers of other people's food. Upayaja figured that if his brother was so unconcerned with his purity, he just might be willing to perform this kind of sacrifice for pay. King Drupada then funded an elaborate sacrifice to be performed, with Yaja as a supervising priest. When everything was all put together, the fire lit and the oblations readied, Yaja called on Drupada's wife, saying, Present yourself. Now is the time to take the oblation. Prepare to have your children. Drupada's queen objected, saying, Wait a few minutes. I need to get ready. The sacrifice was at the critical moment, however, and there was nothing to be done. So Yaja threw the oblations into the fire, and out of the fire came, fully grown, a handsome boy named Drusted Yumna, who was destined to be Drona's bane. The fire did not die down, however. There was to be another child. This one was a girl, a beautiful princess named Krishna because of her dark complexion, who would have as much of a role in the death of Drona as her brother. At this point, if you're keeping track, we already have two characters named Krishna, and we haven't even met the real Krishna yet. The first Krishna is Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa, whom we call Vyasa. The second is Drupada's daughter. Both are named Krishna because they are both dark of complexion. To preserve the name Krishna for the most famous person of that name, we'll call Drupada's daughter by her more famous name, Draupadi, which basically means Drupada's daughter. King Drupada took in his son and immediately set him to work, learning all the skills of warfare. As for Draupadi, it was time to set up a swayamvara so she could pick her husband. When the Pandavas heard this story from the passing Brahmin, they all got excited at once. Their mother, Kunti, shared their restlessness, saying that life in this village no longer had any appeal, and it seemed like a good time to get moving, and perhaps Panchala would be a nice place to visit. The five Pandavas all agreed, and so they decided to leave for Panchala. Almost as soon as they had reached this decision, the sage Vyasa showed up. He too had heard of the happenings in Panchala, and happened to also know about Draupadi's past incarnation. He explained to the boys that she had been a maiden in her prior life who had trouble finding a husband. She had prayed to Shiva, and when he came to her presence, she repeated her request five times. Shiva replied, Fine, you shall have five husbands. She protested that she really only wanted one, but Shiva told her it was too late. In her next life, she would be given five great and virtuous husbands. Vyasa then encouraged the Pandavas to head for Panchala and Draupadi Swamvara and to win her for themselves as their bride. Meanwhile, in Panchala, King Drupada was busy planning his daughter's Swayamvara. It is unclear what he knew of the Pandava's adventure in the House of Wax, but he somehow knew that Arjuna was still around, and he planned a challenge so difficult that he knew only Arjuna would be able to overcome it. While our storyteller seems to deliberately avoid broaching the issue, it is hard not to think that we have here a case of two natural allies seeking each other out. The Pandavas, in hiding after an assassination attempt and effectively banished from their own kingdom, are seeking out the king that has the biggest grudge against the Kuru nation, King Drupada. Drupada, for his part, is clearly angling to have his daughter ally herself with the Pandavas. No one ever broaches the subject of alliances in the story, but this seems very much like the French kings harboring the last Stuart claimants to the throne of England. Such an alliance would be a perfect cover for some future invasion of his aggressive neighbor to the north. Getting back to our heroes, they left the village of Ekachakra, still disguised as Brahmins, and made their way towards Panchala and Draupadi Swayamvara. They must have been anxious to get there in time, because they traveled by day and by night. Along the way, however, as they forded the Ganges, they encountered a Gandharva at play with his women in the river. The Gandharva was pretty annoyed that he had been disturbed during the night. He declared that the night was reserved for supernatural creatures, and that humans should all stay indoors. While Rakshasas seemed to be Bhima's responsibility, Gandharvas were dealt with by Arjun. So Arjuna squared off with this Gandharva, and they had a brief battle. Ultimately, Arjun produced his Brahma's head weapon and used it to roast the Gandharva's chariot. The chariot was reduced to ashes, and the Gandharva ridiculously fell on his face. Impressed and humiliated, the Gandharva surrendered and offered the Pandavas a team of celestial horses. He also suggested that they get themselves a priest. He pointed out that any warrior who hoped to be successful should have a skilled priest at hand for advice and for sacrifices. The Gandharva illustrated his point with a story about an ancestor of the Pandavas, a king named Samvarana. 
This king had fallen in love with the daughter of the sun god. She was unattainable until King Samvarana enlisted the help of a powerful priest named Vasishta. According to the genealogies, this episode occurred when the Bharatas were still in exile, and it was King Samvarana's son, Kuru, who, with the advice of Vasishta, was able to reconquer his ancestral lands. The Gandharvan storyteller then went into a much longer digression about Vasishta and his feud with Vishvamitra. If you're looking for ways the Mahabharata got so obese over time, this collection of stories feel like they might be one of the later insertions. Remember, Vasishta is the guy with the great cow who cursed Dyaus, who ended up born as Bhishma. Well, we get an adventure of his that involve an encounter with Vishvamitra, who was the king who prayed so hard he became an honorary Brahmin, and he fathered Shakuntala in episode 4. Further into these stories, we find out that Vasishta had a grandson named Parasara, who is presumably the same Parasara who fathered Vyasa on Satyavati. Thus, the stories can be justified because they involve the ancestors of our heroes. Remember, Shakuntala is King Bharata's mother, and Parasara is Vyasa's father. The stories do include a rather amusing scene in which Vasishta's cow shits out an army of barbarian warriors but it's all rather difficult to follow, sordid, and complicated, so unless you're compiling a genealogy for some of the characters, I think it only confuses things. I'll leave this one for the unabridged version and move on. At the end of the storytelling session, Arjuna asked the Gandharva if he had a particular priest to recommend. The Gandharva suggested that they look up Dhamya, who was on the way to Panchala. The Pandavas then made to move on, leaving their celestial horses in the care of the Gandharva and also making a gift of the Brahma head weapon to him. As they approached Panchala, the Pandavas stopped by Dhamya's ashram and asked him to be their spiritual preceptor. Dhamya agreed, and they all felt like they were as good as crowned and married as long as they had this great Brahmin as their advisor. Now, with their priest in tow, they approached the capital of Drupada's kingdom. As they neared the city, they were joined by large numbers of Brahmins, all flocking to the city to enjoy the handouts and the spectacle of the royal Swamvara. The Brahmins all remarked on Arjun's build and looks, and suggested that perhaps the princess might choose him for a husband. As I mentioned before, King Drupada also had the notion of ensnaring Arjun for his daughter, so he set up a challenge as part of the Swamvara. First, he laid out an enormous bow, which only an immensely strong hero would be able to string. Secondly, he set up a mechanical target on a high spot, with moving parts and a small orifice through which the target was to be hit. The entertainments went on for two weeks, while all the rishis and princes of India came pouring into the city to witness and participate in the great challenge. The king had erected many palaces to house his guests, and a large arena where he would hold the final ceremony. Finally, on the sixteenth day of the event, the priest held a sacrifice, and then the princess was brought out, led by her brother, Dristed Yumna, carrying a garland of flowers. Whoever was able to string the bow and strike the target would win the garland and become Draupadi's husband. Then, all the princes gathered there were introduced. I will spare you all the names of these kings and princes, but the Mahabharata does not. Nearly 100 are named, including Duryodhana and his brothers, his uncle Shakuni, Karna, and none other than Krishna Vasudeva and his brother Balaram. This is the first mention of Krishna in the Mahabharata. Here he is, attending the pageant like any other prince, and no background is ever given. The story just assumes that we know all about Krishna already, and so he only appears when he has something to do with the Pandavas, who are the heroes of this story. I will not leave you empty-handed, however. In the next episode, I'll fill you in on how Krishna was born and try to get you caught up to this point in Krishna's career. Krishna is a critically important character in this story. Indeed, he is so important that he has his own book called the Bhagavata Purana, or Srimad Bhagavata, which I will refer to in the coming episodes to get you the story of Krishna's birth and rise to worldly power. For us Westerners, it is often hard to accept the fact that this peripheral character also happens to be the lord of the universe. He is mostly just another human being in the story, with loves and passions, but every once in a while, it is pointed out that he is also God incarnate, and occasionally he proves it. So there's no use in trying to second-guess this story, thinking that maybe there was a historical figure named Krishna, and he was just a regular guy, but at some point he managed to become a cult leader. There just isn't any getting around it. Krishna is the embodiment of all that is, was, and will ever be, and that's that. Getting back to the tournament, even the gods made an appearance, including Yama and Shiva and the Elementals. 
As the crowd was milling around looking for seats, Krishna spotted the twins, Nakula and Sahadev, and then pointed out to his brother Balaram that the Pandavas were attending the event, disguised as Brahmins. Recall that Krishna was a cousin to the Pandavas, since his father Vasudeva's sister was Kunti, so presumably they had met before. The contest had begun, and all the princes were deeply desirous of winning Draupadi's hand. Prince and king alike attempted to string the massive bow, and each failed, being thrown to the ground by the bow's recoil. Duryodhana and all his brothers each made the attempt and failed. Following them, Karna took up the bow. He was able to string the bow quite easily. The crowd went silent, and everyone held their breath. As Karna took up the first of the five arrows and took aim, Draupadi called out, I will not marry the son of a Sutta. With a disdainful laugh, Karna threw down the bow and stalked out of the stadium. Following Karna's embarrassment, the last of the nobility tried and failed to string the bow. When no more princes were left who dared to make the attempt, Arjun presented himself from among the Brahmins. The crowd was disconcerted. Many thought it improper and even disgraceful for a Brahmin to try for this prize especially since they assumed a Brahmin, who lived on roots and offerings, would only fail and embarrass his entire caste. But no one stopped Arjuna as he circumambulated the bow and then picked it up. Everyone gasped as he effortlessly strung the bow. He then notched all five arrows at once and fired them all through the moving aperture and struck the target. The target was completely detached from its mount and fell to the ground. The crowd went into an uproar and even the gods in the heavens gave a cheer for Arjuna and rained down flower petals. It was just at that moment that King Drupada recognized Arjuna, and he was delighted to know that his plan had worked. Draupadi then approached Arjun with a white robe and a garland of flowers, which he placed over his shoulders. Arjun was then saluted by all the Brahmins. Yudhishthira, sensing trouble, quietly slipped out along with the rest of his brothers. Arjun also departed with his new fiancée. The assembled princes and warriors were not so happy, however. They felt cheated that the most eligible princess in the world had been handed over to a lowly priest, and they started to riot, specifically targeting King Drupada. The king ran to the Brahmins for protection, since a Kshatriya would never dare harm a Brahmin. Hearing the commotion, Arjun and his brothers all re-entered the arena and ran to protect the king and the Brahmins from the attackers. A huge melee broke out, convincing Krishna and his brother that these indeed were the Pandavas, and that they had survived the house fire in Varanavata. Karna still hadn't recognized Arjuna, but he rushed forward to attack him. The Kshatriyas reasoned that while it was still bad to kill a helpless Brahmin, if the Brahmin wants to engage in a fight, well, that's another matter. So the kings and princes all pressed the attack against the Pandavas. Duryodhana and his brothers had no such scruples, and they skirmished gleefully with the rest of the assembled Brahmins. Karna rushed forward to attack Arjuna, but was stopped in his tracks by a blast of arrows from the massive bow Arjuna just won. His armor was unpierced, but the impact blew the wind out of him, and Karna was temporarily laid low. After recovering, he took a more cautious approach to his enemy, and the two showered each other with arrows. Impressed, he asked Arjun what kind of Brahmin could be so skilled at weapons. Arjun replied that he was a master of Brahman, and thus he possessed supernatural abilities at arms. The other Kshatriyas were coming to the same conclusion. They could not believe that a handful of ordinary Brahmins would be able to hold them all at bay. So they reasoned that their opponents must be supernatural creatures of some sort and began to retreat. Finally, Krishna himself stepped in and called out to the Kshatriyas, arguing that Draupadi had been won fair and square, that they had no justification for this dispute. Having been checked by their opponents, the kings and princes were inclined to agree, and they backed away from the battle. Kunti, meanwhile, had not attended the event and was sitting at the guest house, worrying about her sons. Just then, Arjuna called in from the street that he had just acquired a wonderful donation. Kunti, out of habit, called back, Be sure to share it with your brothers. Only then did she look out and see that what Arjuna had brought her was his bride. Thus, driven by fate, Kunti had ordered her sons to share Draupadi amongst them. As the five brothers congregated, Arjuna had presented Draupadi to his eldest brother, saying, According to Dharma, it is the eldest brother who should marry first. Therefore, I present you the bride I have won. Yudhishthira, looking around at his brothers, could tell that they were all equally in love with this heavenly beauty, and he knew that to take her for himself would only cause division among them. And so, considering Kunti's accidental phrasing, he read the workings of fate and determined that the best option for them would to have them all marry her. In ancient Vedic India, 
polyandry was as rare and unusual as it is today. Husbands from wealthy backgrounds commonly married multiple wives, but women having more than one husband was unheard of and generally considered unlawful or taboo. Thus, having one wife for all five of the Pandavas was exceedingly exceptional and had to be explained in a number of ways. First, there was a past life incident in which Draupadi asked for her husband five times and was granted five husbands for her next life. Secondly, we learned that Kunti never spoke a lie, and so, when she instructed her sons to share their winnings equally, it had to be carried out just as she said. Finally, Yudhishthira knew almost instinctively the importance of maintaining cohesion among his brothers. While I might think that sharing a common woman would be a huge cause for discord, Yudhishthira came to the opposite conclusion. He is, after all, the son of Dharma, so we can only assume it was the best decision. It was certainly fateful, if nothing else. Shortly after this decision was reached, Krishna Vasudev, the Krishna, showed up at their doorstep, along with his brother Balaram. This is the first recorded meeting of the Pandavas with their cousin Krishna. The Pandavas were surprised that they had been discovered, but apparently only Krishna had seen through their disguise. After greeting their mother, his aunt, Krishna soon departed. The Pandavas were to have one more visitor that day. This one was Draupadi's brother, Drusted Yumna, and he came secretly to find out what he could about the man who had just won his sister so triumphantly. After spying on their comings and goings for a while, Drusted Yumna slipped back into the palace where his father was waiting fretfully for news of these strangers who had taken his daughter away. Drusted Yumna's report back to his father was the picture of a close and modest family. The original is provided lovingly as a poem, and my guess is it was probably put to song. He described how, after formally presenting Draupadi to their mother, the brothers set out again to beg alms, while Draupadi remained with her mother-in-law. When the brothers returned, they handed in all the offerings to their mother. The mother then directed Draupadi to make the appropriate offerings to the gods and ancestors, and then divide up the food among them, giving the largest share to Bhima. Everyone ate up the food that had been prepared by Draupadi, and then Nakula laid out some fresh grass as bedding, and they all lay down to sleep. The five brothers all slept next to each other, with their mother laying at their heads and Draupadi sleeping at their feet. Drusted Yumna noted that their conversation was all about the day's battle, tactics, and strategies. This information was taken as a good sign by King Drupada. He felt that while the family was clearly of modest means, that they must be of good warrior stock. He was still uncertain whether his future sons-in-laws were indeed the Pandavas, however. The next day, the king sent an emissary out to invite these mysterious in-laws to visit him at his palace. Wanting more assurance that these were indeed well-born Kshatriyas, Drupada ordered an exhibition be arranged of precious items from each class of people. He laid out finely wrought farm tools and intricately woven ropes, which would interest a person of the peasant class. In another display, he placed fine clothes and trade items, which might interest a merchant. He also laid out fine weapons and chariots to introduce a warrior, and finally, he displayed holy books and religious implements that might draw the attention of a priest. When the five brothers arrived at the palace, they were received regally, and they quite naturally took up their positions of honor, allowing themselves to be seated in golden thrones and served rich foods. When the feast was over, they were all immediately drawn to admire the weapons and chariots that Drupada had put on display. Watching this behavior in his guests, King Drupada was emboldened to ask them if they were indeed the Pandavas who had won his daughter's hand. Yudhishthira assured the king that they were indeed them. He then filled the king in on the failed assassination attempt and their adventures in exile. King Drupada cursed King Dhritarashtra and promised Yudhishthira that he would do all in his power to help restore the princes to their inheritance. He ordered the Pandavas to be moved out of their hut and to live with him in the palace. Drupada then gathered the Pandava family together and said, Let us hold the wedding today. Let my daughter be married to the hero Arjuna. Yudhishthira responded, Then I too must take up my wife today. The king replied, Then you may marry my daughter instead, or assign her to whichever brother you like. Yudhishthira then broached the idea that they had come up with of all five brothers marrying her collectively. He explained how they came to this conclusion because of his mother's fateful gaffe. Imagine Drupada's chagrin to hear what these foreign boys were planning to do to his daughter. It would be interesting to hear what Draupadi thought of the whole thing, but she had been taken off to the women's quarters after the feast, and no one asked her opinion. Never fear, we'll hear from Draupadi in a big way later on, but at this point she's just an obedient princess, carrying out whatever plan her male relatives decide for her. Yudhishthira laid out his arguments, saying his mother never lies, 
that the five brothers are committed to sharing all their treasures equally, and finally saying that it must be okay, because he said it's okay. He is, after all, the son of Dharma. Drupada wasn't convinced. He was surprised that someone so well-versed in Dharma as Yudhishthira could suggest such an abomination. He admitted that Dharma is not easily interpreted, but polyandry was simply unheard of. Clearly not wanting to renege on his deal, and not wanting to throw away this valuable alliance, Drupada decided to defer his decision to his son. As they were conferring, the sage Vyasa made an appearance. You might have noticed by now that Vyasa likes to intervene in his own story when the plot gets a bit thick. In this case, he clearly needed to step in and convince Drupada that this pack of strangers really were doing the right thing with this corporate marriage that they had in mind. But before he laid out his arguments, he did admit that the practice of polyandry was indeed contrary to the Vedas and an obsolete practice. He then asked their opinions. First, Drupada answered, saying that the practice was unheard of and sinful. He found no precedent for such a decision. Next, his son Drusted Yumna stated that for an older brother to lie with his younger brother's wife was immoral. Yudhishthira was able to cite a precedent, where seven rishis married one woman, but he mostly stuck to his point that if he said it, it must be lawful. Finally, Kunti chimed in, saying she was constitutionally incapable of speaking a lie, so what could be done about that? Vyasa then told Drupada that he had a perfect explanation for why his daughter should take on five husbands, but that it was kind of a secret. So he took Drupada aside and told him a story about the five Indras. The story of the five Indras is one of the strangest that I've come across. The story begins with the great sacrifice in the Naimisha woods being carried out by the gods themselves. They even recruited Yama, the king of the dead, to be the ceremonial butcher. During the sacrifice, the gods complained that the mortals had stopped dying, and so they are equals to the gods. Brahma reassured them that it was only temporary, while Yama was busy with the sacrifice. As soon as he was done with the sacrifice, then people would die as expected. The story is a dreamlike quality, because at this point the gods get distracted by a lotus flowing down the river Ganges. Indra gets up to investigate, and somehow follows it upstream to the river's source, where he sees a woman crying. Indra follows this weeping woman to a mountain peak, where a divine young man is sitting with a crowd of women all around, playing dice. Indra was ticked off that this kid ignored his approach, so he yelled at him, saying, I am Indra, king of the gods. The boy just laughed. Indra grew furious, so the boy told the weeping woman, Bring him here, we'll see if we can tame his pride. As soon as the woman touched Indra, the great god fell limp on the ground. We now learn that this boy is the god of the dread bow, whoever that is. He lifted off a mountaintop and threw the limp Indra into its chamber. Inside that chamber, there are already four other Indras, all equally proud and full of splendor. The dread bowman said, You have offended me, just like these others. So enter this cave, and you will stay there. Indra whimpered, Is there any way you'll let me out of here? The dread bowman laughed and said, You will eventually have your escape, along with the others. You shall all enter a human womb, and having fought many battles in human form, you shall again return to the world of Indra. The Indras agreed, but insisted that while their mother would be human, their fathers must be gods. The dread bowman then decreed that Shri herself, or Lakshmi, would also incarnate on the earth and become their wife. The text doesn't make it quite clear, but I suspect this dread bowman is Shiva. I can only guess that this story might be an allegory for the decline of Indra and the rise of Shiva and Vishnu as objects of worship in Hindu devotion. So this is how Vyasa explained that the five Pandavas were all the incarnation of the god Indra, and Draupadi was the incarnation of Indra's consort. Therefore, it was all preordained that she be their wife. As if to reinforce the dreamlike quality of this interlude, Vyasa's story then drifted off to describe how the god Hari, or Vishnu, plucked two hairs from his head, one white and one black, and planted these hairs into two women of the Yadus, Rohini and Devaki, the white one becoming Balaram, while the black hair became Krishna. To punctuate his story, Vyasa then temporarily granted Drupada divine sight. He looked at the five Pandavas, and instead saw five identical images of the Lord Indra himself in all his glory. Finally, like a good lawyer digging up any case, however inconsistent, to support his claim, Vyasa rehashed the story about the maiden who begged Shiva for a husband five times. That was enough for King Drupada. He was convinced. Arrangements were made to hold the wedding the next day. One of the things I find endearing about the Mahabharata is the way it goes to such pains to give you everyone's point of view on a subject. 
You might disagree with or be skeptical about some decision or outcome, but you can be sure that it was carefully considered on all sides. It also makes it even more interesting when some question you might have goes unanswered.